Blood Brothers Podcast of the Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there. Welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Dili Hussein. Uh, today's guest is someone who I've been uh, waiting for to have on for some time, and due to COVID 19 and uh, other things, we've had to delay. But alhamdulillah, uh, she is a celebrated figure of the Muslim community. Um, she's uh, an established author, an activist, uh, Daya, and her credentials and her accolades are many. Um, but I will wait for this episode to proceed so you guys can all understand uh, how beneficial today's guest can be, her experiences, and what she has to say. And that's none other than Sister Naima B. Robert. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Jazakumullah Khair for coming on, sis. It's great to be here. Jazakumullah Khair. Alhamdulillah. Um, I'm going to go straight into it. Um, the nature of your work, the nature of your output, your content, mm. uh, falls right within what many would regard as women's empowerment or Muslim women's empowerment. And <coughs> women's empowerment is such a broad concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a concept which has been dominated essentially by many Western values and cultures. Some, one could argue, somewhat alien and even in opposition to the mm. Islamic tradition. In your years... Of being involved in this uh, sphere, have you ever identified any, not problems, but any dangers and pitfalls that our sisters and even some of our men folk can fall into? Bismillah. Well, for sure, because you know, too much of anything can be a bad thing, um, and uh, I think empowerment in the in this case and sort of what we've been talking about what we've been really working on for the last you know few decades really Mm. is people taking ownership of their lives women in particular taking ownership of their lives taking responsibility um for their own selves for their spiritual state for Mm. their emotional state for their mental health for how they show up in the world and one of the reasons why this is so important is that in many of our cultures Um, women are almost encouraged to become almost victims where everything is up to somebody else. Everything is someone else's responsibility, someone else's fault. I just go with the flow. I just do what I'm supposed to do. And I just, you know, whatever my situation, it's not me. Like I didn't do it. But the reality is that we are constantly making choices and we should be aware of those choices and the consequences of those choices when we're making them. So with regards to empowerment, of course, when most people think of empowerment, you know, there's a there's a vision, there's an image. And, you know, maybe not for everyone, but for some people, they think of the Western woman, you know, it's words like liberation, like freedom, Absolutely. like, you know, kind of, you know, power and, you know, taking charge and boss lady and all of this kind of thing. Um, you know, which of course is, you know, media driven. So it's completely makes sense that people see it that way. Uh, and certainly liberation has been sort of the carry, the carry and call of the women's movement since the 60s. And I think that when you see sisters working in this field, working to empower other Muslim women, most of us from within the Islamic community, we're not modeling it on Western women. We're not looking at even liberation per se, because what is Islam? Islam is submission. No, absolutely. Right? So if I'm on a move or on some kind of mission to liberate Muslim women, I need to be really careful what am I liberating them from, right? <laughs> Again, it can't be from submission to Allah or you know, submitting to the rules of Islam or even the roles that we've been asked to play. My work has nothing to do with that. Empowerment comes from a recognition that you have choices and that those choices have consequences, they have costs, and you are allowed to make choices. And you should, because taking responsibility for those things I said, the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, means that you're not just going with the flow and you're the victim of somebody else's choices and narrative, etc. But you yourself can stand and say, I'm looking after my emotional health. I'm looking after my mental health. I am making sure that my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sound. Mm -hmm. That's my responsibility. For me, that is the empowerment. That is when you start to be almost like an adult, you know, where it's like, this is me and this is my life and it's mine to live. And I must do that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me, 
You know, he will ask me if I had opportunities to grow as a Muslim and I didn't take them up, he's going to ask me about that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had, as we mentioned, sort of trauma, you know, from childhood that is affecting the way I show up as a wife, as a mother, etc., it's my responsibility to look after that, to deal with that, to get help with that. Mm. So it really is about Muslim women valuing themselves enough to take care of themselves in that holistic way. I like that definition. I think that's a very good definition that's for empowerment. Definition. Yeah, that's a that's a big definition. But let me. But while you were saying all that, Sanima, my mum came into my thought, mm-hmm. right? And when you said particular cultures or certain cultures, right? I'm, I can only speak for the South Asian Desi culture. Uh, the indo pak Bengali culture. And if I were to speak to my mum, who got married at a very young age, 16, 17, right? Very yeah. young age. An arranged marriage to my father. Came to this country <coughs> also at a very young age. Um, if I was to probe her, she would say that she had little to no choices in the conventional sense, mm-hmm. right? And I would probably even go as far as to say that she would regard this to be her role as an obedient wife, Right? As per what she was taught by her, her women folk, her, her mother, her grandmother and so forth. Where does the line get blurred, if it does, where there is an aspect of, you know, obeying your husband in that which Islam says you should, yeah. right? And there you're not having any choice or any kind of uh, agency. Mm-hmm. I love that question and I love the fact that you thought of your I thought mother. Of, I thought my mum, as soon as you were saying, I was like, yeah. how my mum... Would my mum say that everything that's happening because of the choices your dad made? Yeah. She probably would say that, though. Yeah, no, she probably would. She'd probably be right. Yeah. Because, you know, that, that generation of women, mm. they lived a certain way. And yeah. they also had a certain set of tools at their disposal. What I think is important for us to do, though, and I find that men do tend to do this, is that they think of their mothers, they think of women of the <laughs> past. <laughs> that's <just a> name <laughs> <for t-> t- <laughs> gunshot <laughs> Um, but this generation of women and the one coming after and the, probably the ones that will come, you know, Abaddon, yeah. are nothing like those women. Are there any values that we can take from that generation? You're trying to go back to that generation, I'm, right? I'm, 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 but, not, but I just want to know, are there any values that we'll can... We'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there. I just want to clarify that, you know, it's... I, I, it, I find it triggering when people go back to the past and say, in the old days, it was like this. Before this happened, we were so good. Families were so good. Da-da. You know, like when women had, you know, um, when women had fewer choices, life was simpler. I didn't say that. I, no, 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 no. I'm, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. But the thing is, it's true. Life was simpler then. Yeah. You did as you were told. Yeah. Fair enough. However, there's always a price to pay. I believe that very strongly. You know that Dickens saying, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I think it comes from A Tale of Two Cities. Yes, yes, yes. This is always the case. Even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was the best of times, but it was the worst of times. There was great things happening for the deen, but there was much suffering as well, right? And so when people kind of hark back to the old days, the golden age, the olden, you know, like before everything was confusing... I always feel that they're romanticizing the past and they are trying to bring that filter of the past and put it on today and say we should just simply go back to where we were. Now, I'm not saying that there were not values that we need to retain, that we need to reclaim. I believe that there are. There are certain things that our dean teaches us, in particular about relationships between men and women, for example, relationship between the husband and wife, the yeah. roles within the family. These are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified for us. So there's no need for us to kind of reinvent the wheel on that, you know, and that's the difference, I think, between Muslims who are connected with Islam mm-hmm. and Islamic Islamic heritage and the West. Yeah. Because the West is constantly reinventing itself. Uh, and not all, the, not everyone in the West, because obviously conservatives in the West are not doing that. Not. They're trying to hold on to, yeah, <laughs> you know, their, 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 their original values. But the West, if you look at it in terms of the media, in terms of the films, the music, the, the, the videos, the culture is always reinventing itself. Absolutely. We're not really in that space. We don't have the license to constantly reinvent Muslim society because Muslim society is based on the fact that we're Muslims. Absolutely. Which means that we have a set of rules. Yeah, and scripture, we've, yeah, we we've, we've got a framework. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a framework. Yeah. So going back to my point, the women of those times, your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, they had certain things laid out for them and that made their lives very easy because expectations were lower. 
for everyone, not just the women, the men as well. Because t- trust me when I say your grandmother, your mother, your great grandmother. Times have certainly changed. Those men did regard. not expect to have a ten. 100%. You know, they were not looking for like a ten and a. You know, she has to be this and she has to be that. And yeah. She has to be this and absolutely. you know, I work, like I can't be with a woman who's not X, Y, and Z. They 100%. they weren't on that. No, absolutely. Your yeah. mum chose someone for you. Yes, mum. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm an obedient son. I, you know what I'm no, saying? No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Complete different expectations, yeah. different output, different results. So my point is. The women of today are not those women, just like the men of today are not those men. So while we want to retain the good things that our dean has taught us, Mm. the culture has changed. And that's why when we say, you know, that women of today need to feel a sense of agency, that's because they've been educated. They know the world. They can do everything themselves, right? Mm. Physically, it's possible. Back in the day, it wasn't. Women didn't even have access to knowledge of how to do many things in society. If they were from a village or from a small town and they didn't complete school, there was actually a lot of things they physically could not do. 100%. They only knew what their local Molvi Sabo or Imam Sabo, what their parents taught them. Exactly. Literally. You can't compare them to the women of today who've got, you know, finished education, they've got degrees, they've got careers, they've, they've seen the world, completely different. But what our goal is, is to hopefully inshallah invite every woman to reconnect to her islam Mm. and reconnect to allah first then make choices about career about marriage about children about etc because otherwise you're basically just out in the world trying to find your way like everybody else is probably making the same mistakes that everybody else is making and paying the price that everybody else is now paying and it's only now if you look at how you know, more conservative aspects of Western culture are critiquing things that we've kind of accepted, like feminism. Yeah. Like feminism, like the, you know, the, the whole single mother thing, you know, yeah. just so many different things that, you know, even within Western culture, there is now a real discomfort with a lot of the results of the movements from the 60s. Sure. I would hate to see Muslims basically following blindly this kind of cultural shift that the West is constantly navigating and then paying the price for it in Akhira as well as in the dunya. So how do we, uh, how would you advise to both brothers and sisters, we're not just talking about feminism here, we're talking about the plethora of ideas and values that were born from secular liberalism, yeah. right? It's, 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 it's a whole an array uh, of, of different ideologies and values. Um, what advice would you give then to both Muslim sisters and brothers to avoid those pitfalls mm. where there are genuine grievances, there are genuine issues of discrimination. Um, even the term misogyny, I, I, I don't like it because it has certain connotations, but I know what they mean. Yeah. I know when sisters say that, I know what they mean, yeah. right? But I know what it means in the books of Western ideologies yeah. as well, right? Yeah. How do we deal with those issues whilst not falling into those issues? I think what it requires is a lot of honesty mm. on the part of people who do have knowledge of Islam. Yeah. And when I say honesty, I mean like radical honesty because we sometimes... Uncomfortable honesty. Yeah, uncomfortable because usually, you know, if you're going to be honest, you're going to have to be prepared to be uncomfortable and prepared to be confronted by things that you don't want to see. At the end of the day, nobody wants to see the Muslims struggling. Nobody likes to see Muslims in pain, lost, making mistakes, you know, doing haram. We don't want to see that, No. right? But the reality is it's there. The reality is that every single problem that you see out in Western society is present in the Muslim community. So the first thing I would say is for Muslim leaders to embrace honesty when analyzing the community and saying, no, like on a reel now, what's going on here? You know, and then what does the deen say? What tools has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given us to deal with these issues? Because if you look at the seerah, and I love to go back to seerah, just like for so many different reasons. Let's hear it. When you look at the seerah and you look at the Prophet you know they had to deal with all the things. They dealt with racism. They dealt with classism. They dealt with ableism. They dealt with you know fe- you know sexism, chauvinism, everything, tribalism, Every, everything. Hundred yeah, percent. Everything was present. Like I said, best of times, worst of times, right? Yeah. But they dealt with it. How did they deal with it? The same way they dealt with it. It's the way that we should be dealing with it. But what I'm seeing in the community is that the people who have access to knowledge of the Sira do not want to admit that the problems are there. And the people who are prepared to to address those problems don't have knowledge of the deen. They have 
what they learned at university. They, and that's the language that they oh, use. Oh, you're saying so these two need to connect. It's almost like there needs to be, it is not, well, if they connect, that's great, but it's not necessary for them to connect because I feel like really what needs to happen is that the people with the knowledge need to open their eyes and start listening and, and, and get real about what's happening in the community and not, you know, like, you know, <laughs> there's this thing of Juma khutbas, for example. Yeah. The Juma khutbah is such a powerful tool. Mm. And many people would say that we kind of squander the opportunity to address the whole community at once because we talk about theoretical things. Well, that's been happening for decades now. Exactly. But again, that could change if somebody just said, you know what, our community is hurting and we have to get over the shame of admitting that as Muslims, we don't get it right all the time. So let me just interject here respectfully. Let me posit this to you. Then there will be... Certain mashaykh who I'm sure will even I know we have some avid viewers uh, amongst the ulama who watch this podcast. What, what, what's your views on those who say, "Well, Sister Naima, we get the point, but sometimes there's a strategic timing of ha- uh, of hanging out dirty laundry in the public at a time when we're getting uh, ideologically attacked, militarily attacked abroad. Um, uh, you know, things are being taught to our children at a very young age. There's so many other more pressing issues than to address some of the things which you're talking about." Because you're just giving ammunition to those who already have nefarious agendas against the community. Because that's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. I've heard that, look, we're not disputing. We've got bigger issues. We're not disputing mm. that, for example, in many of our masajid, there are not spaces for our women. We're not disputing that within many of our institutions and our organizations that there should be a more representation of sisters. So the accessibility to knowledge and these services is there for women, etc. We're not disputing those. What we're disputing is the timing of discussing these things so consistently, so frequently, as a result of not giving ammunition to certain organisations who are already accusing the community and the religion of being a misogynistic, a backward, regressive 7th century religion. What's your views on that take? I have so many things to say on say that. It. I beg I have, you say it. I have say so it. many things to say on that. I want to know when we will be allowed to stop reacting and defending because what i see is and i get it i understand everything that you're saying i get it but my issue is this is while we are in defense mode and we've kind of got all the walls up to prevent the attacks from outside our house is being destroyed from within and that is a factor there is no way you can you can deny that while we are erecting these walls to try to keep us from people throwing stones and etc we are dying from within it's like a siege it's like you've got a town and 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 there's a siege on the outside and there is of course there is it's an ideological attack everything all of that's true so we've got this siege mentality where we're like okay barricade us in keep us safe from the outside meanwhile there's the plague on the inside absolutely a lack of food shortage and all sorts food shortages plague rats everything so my thing is are we ever going to feel safe enough to actually start doing our homework and our housekeeping within? Because I've been hearing that argument literally for decades and I can't see it changing anytime soon. I can't see the ideological attack waning. I can't see Muslims becoming... It's worsening. Exactly. And it's going to continue getting worse. But some of these individuals say, Sister Naima, is that, look, whilst it's worsening, when we start talking about some of these grievances, genuine grievances and issues of discrimination... Whether it be with Muslim women or whether it be with black Muslims, whether it be with the various demographics and constituencies that feel aggrieved, right? That we're already we just we're just giving more to those who are laying siege on us because these are certain tropes and certain stereotypes that it it, it, it can be bastardized. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, go for it. Who do we un- answer to ultimately Allah as leaders of the wa community? Ta'ala. Allah no, I'm going to ask again. Who ultimately do we answer to as leaders of any community? We answer to Allah first and foremost. Yes, but yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the answer that's I was it. looking for. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Do you think Allah is going to question us about this? I think Allah will question us. We know he will question us about all things that we did and didn't do in this life. Okay. So my thing is, <sighs> trying to appease the media is a losing game. It's a losing game. You will never... And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already made that clear. Mm. They will never be happy with you. Until you leave your religion. So what we are doing in the West, and this makes me really, really mad, is that what we're doing, we're trying to appease people who have already decided that they do not like what we are upon. 
and they will not agree with or support what we are upon until it looks how they want it to look. 100. So that's why this this kind of acceptance by the mainstream is is a poison chalice and I f- my my concern is that the younger generations of Muslims do not get it because millennials downwards they want to be part of the society. They've been given this idea that multiculturalism and inclusion and everything means that they can be part of the society and stay as Muslims, right? Mm. But the reality is the society will only accept a certain type of Muslim to be part of the society. Mm. So the more we look like them, the more we are accepted. The more we behave like them, the more we are accepted. The more our media, our literature, our our Instagram pages and everything fits their narrative. Sounds, the reads, m- looks like theirs. The it's more we get awards, the more contracts 100. we get, the more deals we get, the book deals, the TV deals and the endorsements and all that kind of thing. That is the reality of what's happening. And so when I say that we answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, our goal should not be to please the people on the outside of the wall. Who are who, who you know who are putting us under siege? Our goal should be to look after our flock. And the problem is, all these things that are coming up that you've mentioned, right? They are so. Um, I was going to say they are minority issues, but when it comes to women, it's not about a minority issue. But they are the issues of the vulnerable in our community. Let's face it: in the Muslim community, men have the power. Not all men. But in general, you'd say the power is concentrated with men. Decision-making, responsibility, etc. Do you see that as inherently problematic? If we were doing what we're supposed to do before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that every one of us is a shepherd. Yes. I don't want the responsibility of the masjid. Mm. I don't want that. Because it's not about power. It's not about control. Because this is the issue when it comes to sort of talking about male power and even misogyny and patriarchy and things mm. like that. Is It's in a context of power. Men have power. White men have power. Rich people have power. As Muslims who believe that we are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not about the power at all. We all know the saying, with great power comes... Yeah, it's great responsibility. As Muslims, it's the responsibility piece. It's not the power. Who cares if you're head of the masjid? Who cares? Who cares if you're on the masjid committee? Seriously? Like, you're going to get a big head from being head of the committee? That just means you've taken on a huge responsibility. That's all. You, so, should, you should actually be having more sleepless nights. Ex- and that, and if you're a responsible leader, that's what it results in. Mm. Yeah. So we don't all want to be in that position. Allah didn't create us all to be in that position, but all of us has our own responsibility. It's like the hadith, mm. you know, it, the, 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 the everyone is a shepherd, is and a they shepherd. will be questioned about their flock. Yeah, so if everyone stayed in their lane and looked after their flock in their lane, we probably would have a lot less of this kind of jostling that takes place. Because the reality is, it's a responsibility. It's an amana. Mm. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question me about. It's not bragging rights. Of course. It's not, yeah, look at me, big things. It's nothing mm. to do with that. It's literally, whew, I need to take care of the situation. So that's what I'm saying about, you know, these issues within the community. They are the people who have less of a voice, who are more vulnerable in the community. Now, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased with a community in which the vulnerable are not taken care of? No way. And are not protected. No way. And are not listened to and are not seen and not heard. No, no. There's, there's many statements from the scholars and tradition that you measure a society by how just you are to those exactly. who are most vulnerable. Exactly. Yeah. So the, 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 because we're seeing this in terms of a power dynamic and mm. feminism does tend to push us into that kind of conversation. Power, power structures. Power, yeah, yeah, power and power, power, power structures. structures. As Muslims, I wish we could just divest from that whole situation and that whole conversation and say, okay, in terms of responsibilities, are we taking care of our responsibilities? And the other, the, the last thing I want to say on this point is, if we don't address those things, if the vulnerable in the community are not taken care of, are not listened to, are not given respect, where then do they go to get the respect, to get the help? Where? T- you tell me, where do they go? To those who are laying the siege, isn't it? Exactly. So you've created... A bigger problem than you had because all these young people who come into kind of who turn the lens of these you know liberal ideas or Muslim you know Western ideas, they turn the lens onto the Muslim community. They find the Muslim community lacking, and there are no answers coming from the Muslim community. So it's it leads to this separation and this distance from the from the Ummah that 
we can't afford our young people to feel distant from the ummah. We can't afford that. 100. They are the ones who are going to be the next generation, who are going to be getting married. Inshallah, we pray. Getting married and having children, Inshallah. we pray. Inshallah. You know, um, but it's it's that serious. It's that serious. It's not something you can afford to say. And it's you know when you say, oh, it's not the right time, and you know everything in its time. It's so clear to me that those people are not listening, because. If you were listening to the people who have the grievances, you would prioritize kind of what they're saying rather than your perception of, no, but everything's fine. Like, this is the biggest issue. Because trust me, when, um, what was the thing that, um, that keeps coming up? And I, I was saying, why as Muslims are we focusing on some of these issues when we've got children who are atheists in our homes? We've got children who don't believe in Allah in our mm -hmm. homes, but we're still debating about this situation and that fiqh and this fiqh and that fiqh and putting time and energy and effort into discussing issues that, trust me, Gen Z don't have a clue. They don't even know the, what you're talking about. If you ask them what is fiqh, mm. many of them won't be able to they tell wouldn't. you. They wouldn't. No. And so here we are, we've got these amazing brains, these amazing people who've memorized the Quran, who understand Arabic, who've read the books, mm. and they are occupied with conversations that have no relevance to the next generations coming up. It's scary to me because these generations are so ignorant of Islam. I look at the, you know, probably we probably maybe came into Islam and started practicing maybe around the same time, I don't know. But I know that when we came in the 90s, the focus was ilm, the focus was knowledge. Some of it we've, you know, kind of had a different take on, but it was still very much, you humble yourself and you learn the deen, isma wa ata, you hear and obey. No. These guys don't have that And that ties in very nicely to, to the next area of discussion I want to have with you And that is Since we've rightly or correctly identified That the concentration of power within the Muslim community uh, Lies predominantly if not entirely with men So therefore the access to knowledge uh, Mainly comes from male scholarship um, And there's been a You know there's been a huge kind of like not uproar, but there's there's been a trend of late. Pushback. Yeah, like yeah. like like okay, why is there an all male panel? How come there's no there's no female um, uh, alimas or or da'iyas in it on the panel and these kind of things? Um, I've even I've even heard in certain corners of the community um, that maybe it's time the time is now for maybe male mashayikh to maybe not even really discuss women's issues because it's something. Is something which the young females of this generation, the Gen Z, the the, the um, that they would connect better with with female scholarship and so forth. What's your thoughts on that? Subhanallah, it's it's a very it's a tough one because it's a tough one for a lot of reasons. I would argue that female scholarship maybe has always been secondary to male scholarship uh, in the Muslim community. It's always been present, but probably not in the in terms of volume yeah. Yeah, and numbers. And, you know, this has been the case throughout history, by the way. It's not just Muslims, it, yeah, it's everybody. It's, right, history, <laughs> and it's not a new phenomenon either. It's everybody. No, I mean, this is, you know, dating way back. You look at the scientists and the inventors and Absolutely. everybody, they're all men. Yeah, and yeah. that's something. Women's role was different. Our role was to, to I guess, I, what the, there's a term that I want to use, and it is to hold the fort. Our role was to hold the fort. Our role was to support the men on their journey and get the ajr that way. Our role was to raise hofar and mm. raise scholars Absolutely. and get the ajr that way. Now, did that mean that we were not allowed to study? No. no. Does it mean that some of us did not excel and, and, and go on to become you know, huge, influential women of knowledge in our time? No, we know. Uh, and of course, we want to know more about this because it's a, a bit of our history that a lot of people don't know about. So without kind of discounting any of that i would say that we need to be careful of using constantly using the lens of gender because it can skew things now as a woman i can say that i have been triggered by scholars probably many times before right not just as a woman but as a woman who grew up you know with a fairly western worldview obviously i'm a revert you know i considered myself a feminist before islam so certain things that they would say they don't sit well when with did you me. accept islam if you don't mind me asking. looking 23 years now 23 years sure. yeah so yeah certain things certain ways that first scholars from back home for example would say things it doesn't sit well with me it's rude i find it disrespectful 
it's a cultural issue because me culturally if somebody says oh women are known to be x y and z i'll say well you're sexist mate like mm. that's sexist yeah that's a sexist statement mm. in your society it might be acceptable to say that but for me it's not acceptable and now i have an issue with you now you're trying to give me advice but i can see that your view of me as a woman is that i'm stupid i'm less than i'm inferior i'm weak and all of these things which i don't accept so i think there's a cultural shift happening where a lot of women and maybe not even a lot maybe it's just the vocal minority i don't know because it could be but there are some scholars and some scholarly traditions that tend to kind of put women in a particular frame and we as women especially women who are educated etc cetera, etc cetera, we just don't accept we don't appreciate it mm. so the problem is it's a communication issue and a cultural issue and i think that when it comes to advice definitely advice coming from a woman islamic advice coming from a woman who has the basis and the knowledge is will definitely be much much more acceptable than a man who's giving advice which is not the same as fiqh okay mm. he's not giving a fatwa that's something else because fiqh is related uh, fatwas are related to fiqh to and rulings, rulings yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. kind sure. of cut it pretty cut and dried yeah. advice now there is an element of lived experience there's an element of perspective there's an element of bringing yourself to whatever the advice is that you're giving mm. and for many men it's very difficult for them to advise a woman because they don't know her reality they've never been a woman before they can only go based on what they've seen from the outside so you know i don't know whether that answers your question no it does so you're you're basically making a differentiation between a uh, male scholarship giving um, teaching on fiqh Right, so so, so teaching um, yeah. Islamic rulings and Islamic yeah. laws, etc., etc. Et you're, you're saying that's one thing, uh, and giving nasiha and advice on life, life experiences, etc., and things to point that's different, and that would be better for a woman. Yeah, and I think, and I think, if we were to look at the reality, I don't really think necessarily there is a feminine way of teaching fiqh. You know what I mean? It's like it's just laws, it is it? what it is. It's you know, it, it is. It, 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 it should not be. It should not be affected by gender, by race. by class it should not be because it's supposed to be based on you know the 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 the, the, the sharia yeah. which is the quran and sunnah however when we're looking at sort of people's qiyas yes. and their opinions Absolutely. then you know that they're going to be bringing their personal stuff well, and their yeah. own kind of you know their own lens to it and we've seen that throughout history and and you know with people from different parts of the world different cultural traditions because for example from what i've observed with uh, desi culture Women in Desi culture fulfill a very very particular role, right? They are home based yep. and they serve the family. And the men serve them on the outside. So the men do the shopping, the men go and work, the men take care of all the stuff outside, women take care of the stuff inside. If you compare that for example with Somali tradition, Somali customs and culture, Somali women are not like that because firstly Somalis are nomads. So in a nomadic culture, everyone has to kind of get involved, you yeah. know? there's still a division of labor but it's much more active it's much more physical it's much more you know you take responsibility for that and we'll take responsibility for this so you see somali women are much more independent they're much stronger they are a lot i would use the word fearless because when i used to uh, work in east london on green street it used to just be so interesting to me to see that after dark there would be no asian women out at all But well, the Somali sister will be there. She'll be going to the shop. She'll be doing this. She'll be doing that. And also, their history as refugees as well. And having left Somalia, often just with the children, the man stayed behind. So sometimes it's not even an Islamic thing. It's literally the culture of that society of those people led to certain roles becoming acceptable or accepted. Yoruba women, for example, mm. Yoruba women, big time business women. and doesn't matter if the husband's wealthy or not she will have her side hustle mm. you know and 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 if she doesn't have one Big up to she's consi- she's considered like you know what are you you're, you're worthless like what are you doing yeah. you know uh, and and they're muslim w- as well w- whereas also women would be again very home orientated very, very, much very so. defined roles and yes. yeah i mean it reminds me of the time when uh, when the when the muhajir when the muhajir yes. they went to and went to medina And there was obviously certain Sahaba went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they complained or, or raised concerns about the Madani women. Yeah. And said that these were women who spoke very um, um, openly and, and very yeah. frankly and candidly and they're influencing our women. Um, you, you recall that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so it reminds me. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was cool with both. He understood and appreciated <sighs> both. Because it was many of the Madani women who were in the battlefield as well. 
there's always a there's always a flip side. There is, and there's all. That's why I was saying is that you know the best of times and the worst of times. Absolutely, you can't have the the good of somebody and not accept the bad that comes with that good. Because everybody has that, you yeah. know, if you have a wife who's particularly, you know, kind of, uh, like you said, very outspoken or not, not, not outspoken, who is very knowledgeable and kind of can take care of business and that kind of thing, which is good. And you appreciate that about her. The chances are she may argue with you. You know, she may disagree with some of your decisions and she may kind of give you a bit of pushback. Mm. But those are two sides of the same coin. Absolutely. Similarly, if you have a woman, mashallah, who is submissive and who's meek and who's obedient on the one side and you like that on the other side, She's not going to be much help when you need advice, you know, necessarily. You know, she's not going to be the one who you go and say, you know, what do you think we should do? She's going to say, whatever you decide, dear. So two sides of the same coin. Um, before we kind of bring the podcast to a close and we actually talk about your new book, inshallah, I want to ask you, just just on, on staying on that theme. So when a male scholar is given a fit class to sisters and they're talking about inheritance laws or what constitutes as witnesses uh, as a requirement in the sharia and these kind of theoretical discussions mm-hmm. um which naturally will require you to explain why there is a disparity between uh, the men and women in these particular fields of the sharia would you suge- would you would you say that even the teaching of that would be in today's generation the je- the, the, the the generation generation z the the, the kind of uh, the woke millennials do you think it would be better if those kind of Fiqh was taught by perhaps women to female sisters, and because you'll have to, right? You'll have to at some point when you talk about the tafsir and the commentary of the of the scholars and of the schools, you're gonna have to explain why those rulings exist and they differ between men and women, right? Or are you saying it's cool that we shouldn't really go into that kind of? Men can only teach on to, to boys and men, and women can only teach to women. And I think if we say that we are innovating something. Hundred percent. I think that we would be we would be making something haram that Allah made halal, which is for men to teach women. the deen and yeah. women to teach the deen. Halas. So I would I would be careful of kind of going into that. Having said that, I would be you know I have to be sensitive to the demographic that we're talking about. I am not from that demographic, so I would probably defer to them. But but it starts before fiqh. Isma wa ata'a comes before fiqh. 100. The iman comes before the fiqh. And it has to. Because once you have the correct aqidah, when you have the belief and you're firmly rooted in that belief, some of these issues, and I say this as somebody who's a revert, right? Once you believe that the Quran is the word of Allah, and that this deen is from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that, that it's, you know, it's it's divinely ordained way to live, there's an element of submission there that is not there if that initial submission has not taken place. Absolutely. Because if I'm still kind of, is the Quran really the word of Allah? Is this really the truth? Then I'm going to pick holes in everything, everything. and I'm going to find an issue with everything. doesn't matter who I am, male, female, old, young, rich, yeah, poor. Yeah. I'm going to say, well, why does it say this? And why did, they, why did they use that word here to talk about so-and-so? Do you know what I mean? Because mm. uh, you know, my heart has not settled on this truth. The foundational uh, it's belief, the submission yeah. that's what islam is and the, and also an understanding as well and i think this is something i try to tell my sons you guys are in the midst of a cultural shift the shift will continue so where you are now where you see your your lens the, you know the lens with which you view the world today in 10 years time it will have moved on because 10 years ago it wasn't like this and in 10 years time it's going to be different certain things will be acceptable then that are not acceptable now certain things will be unacceptable then that are you know that are fine now mm. so this is not the gospel this reality that we're living in this society is not the haq it's not the truth it's something that will continue shifting and changing and and uh, for want of a better word um evolving mm. Whereas the deen is the truth for eternity. No. At certain points in history, our deen, certain aspects of our deen will sit us very nicely on the right side of the cultural narrative. At other times in history, it's going to shift. The pendulum Absolutely. is going to switch. It, look, for example, when eco, you know, the, the ecology and um, the eco-movement was really, really big, early 2000s. Yeah. 
Muslims were loving that because our deen teaches us that already. Yeah. So we felt like we're on the right side of history, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you look at where we are today, for example, with you know LGBTQI LGBT issues, issues so, yeah. we're, the we, we're on the opposite side of the cultural narrative. And yeah. as Muslims, we have to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And that only comes from the Iman. Because if you're trying to fit in, and I, we said this earlier, if you're trying to fit into this society, if you're trying to be accepted, if you're trying to to be anyone in this society, you're going to have to play by their rules. And their rules are not the Quran, and they're not the Sunnah, and their rules are constantly changing, whereas our rules have been set for us by the Lord of all the worlds. So once we can make peace with that, and it's okay to be of the Ghuraba, it's fine. It's okay to be strange. It's okay. As Muslims, especially in the West, we have a phobia of of looking like anything. 100%. Looking chauvinist, looking sexist, looking... I'm not saying that we should just be like, yeah, what? That's our deen and yeah, what do you yeah, want? Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not saying that because yeah. there's an element of da'wah as well course, that's really course, important. Absolutely, 100. But, again, we always... It's like we forget this deen began strange and it will, it will end strange, strange as it began. 100. So give glad tidings to, to the, the strangers. strangers. It's okay to be strange. It's okay to not be of, on the, you know, like in the, on the latest trend. It's okay for people to look at you and think they're weird. It's okay. Mm. And do you know who I look at? I look at like conservative Christians. I look at um, the, uh, the the Amish and people like that. I'm not saying we should be Amish. No, no, but basically those people who generally society sees as bonkers and 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 and. and, and yeah. Mormons and these kind of yeah, Amish yeah. and these kind of people, yeah, yeah. You know, th- and we, of course, we want to be cool. Yeah, we want to be cool. Yeah, we yeah. don't want to be like them, yeah, yeah. yeah, because we're looking at them and say, "Oh my God, look at them!" You know, the Hasidic Jews yeah, yeah. and people like that. But they're we still holding it down. They're still holding. And it And they down. don't care. Yeah, yeah, they don't care. The point is that they don't care mm. because, as far as they're concerned, they are on the truth, mm. and it is God that they answer to. And mm. we live in a godless society. That's 100. the that's the fact of the matter. A, yeah, of course. So, anytime you're thinking that. Con- conforming to the ways of the society is is somehow going to make Muslims look better. Mm. Trust me, it's a downward spiral. It's a downhill game, and there's the, you, it's it, you know it's it's a zero sum game. Mm. We're not here for that. We're not here to pander to anyone else's ideology. We're not here to make ourselves look woke or cool or anything by anyone else's standards. I want to look cool before Allah. That's how I. That's I want Allah to see me. And say, you know what? I rate you. You're trying. Your heart's in the right place. You're, you know, you're you're making mistakes, but you're figuring it out. I rate you. That's how I want Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to see me. I don't care what anyone else thinks. It, it makes no difference to me whatsoever. One hundred. We're on the same page here. Um, Alhamdulillah. Some some very wise words. Some very wise words from Sister Naima. Um, onto your book. Show up. Uh, also remember to post the link. At the bottom of the screen, yeah? Um, this is what number publication of yours, sis? I think it might be 26. 26. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, your most popular book prior to this, throughout the moment, I think it's from my sister's lips. It's That's the right. one. It's the one that I most commonly mm. hear about. Um, can people buy this? They can pre-order it. Pre-order it. And its release date is 26th of February. 26th of February. So, around the corner. Very much The so. timing of the podcast was sick, mashallah. Um, and tell us a bit about the book. Uh, what what is a motivational message for Muslim women? What kind of motivational message? Is it's what we book? were talking about at the beginning. Okay, it's taking ownership. Taking ownership. Taking ownership. Right. Stepping up to be the hero of your life story and not playing victim anymore. Okay. Because the thing is, <laughs> a lot of us, and this is men and women. Somebody said to me, I should do a version for men as well, um, because I was going to ask you that. Yes. Well, we said maybe we'll do one for men. We'll do one for families. We'll do one for students. You know, there'll be different uh, different spin offs. Mm. But the thing is that this is the reality of life. Mm. It, the reality of life is this. Every one of us is the protagonist of our own story, right? Is the main character in our life story. Yeah. We don't get to choose the plot points. We don't get to choose the circumstances, the challenges, the things that come in our path. But we choose our goal. And we choose how to respond to each one of those challenges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with free will with discernment, with the ability to choose our responses. Many of us do not make the choices that will get us to where we want to be. We just go with the flow. We react to things, we respond emotionally to things, you know, we just let things happen and we kind of on autopilot a lot of the time. This book is a call to everyone to decide that their life is a masterpiece 
and they're going to live it as a masterpiece and they're going to show up as the hero of their life story no matter what lies in their way so that's the empowerment that we were talking about at the beginning um at the beginning of the book bismillahir rahmanir rahim uh, introduction it came as a shock i found him unconscious on the bed early on saturday morning and within two weeks he was gone a shock and out of the blue out of nowhere blinding shock is this in reference to your first husband yeah uh, who passed away mm-hmm. may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make easy from the grave and, and grant him jannat al firdaus i mean um how come you started the book with this particular that was the quote. beginning of my journey um i couldn't have written show up while my husband was alive allah yarhamu and i think it's that understanding that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses tests for us mm. to help us grow to help us evolve to allow us to blossom into the best version of ourselves we live a life without tests and trials we are in a comfort zone for our whole lives we pretty much stagnate and the lessons that i learned since he passed away allah yarhamu i mean or what allow me to show up today because of the trials because of the difficulties because of those tests i learned things about myself i discovered a new version of myself and and kind of you know you're just pushed to the edge of the cliff and you just have to you have to just go yeah. and then you take that step part of you thinks that you're going to fall but then all of a sudden your wings open and you start to fly and if you had not stepped off that cliff you would never have known that you had wings the wind beneath my wings oh yeah and is that what our brother suleiman henry amankhwa was for yeah. you could you briefly tell us the context of his passing uh he well it was very sudden uh he um he fell into a coma and he was in a coma for 2 weeks and then he was gone and within this book um is there advice and nasiha on how to deal with those kind of incidents mm-hmm. um in terms of trauma and these kind of things i think not so much trauma i think trauma is a big word i think trauma is a very big word and you know it it requires real time and attention i just talk about tests okay. i just tests talk about obstacles. tests obstacles challenges loss mm. um you know because we will all experience these every mm. single one of us you know mm. um whether it's the loss of a parent the loss of a spouse loss of a child loss of a job loss of a house you know just loss in general is baked into the dna of this life like that's what it's about and a loss is a disruption and i believe allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us those disruptions when we need to make some shifts and we need to make some changes we need to change our perspective we need to change our actions our attitude something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires from us but what i talk about in the book is this ability to see the tests through the lens of gratitude where if something happens my question my first question is not like how people are like oh why me why now you know like how could this happen to me or those mm. types of questions are mm. not helpful the type of questions that i'm encouraging people to ask are what could be great about this what does allah want me to learn from this what has allah baked into this test for me what can i get out of this because we know the affa- the affair of the believer is amazing it's one of my favorite hadith absolutely when good comes to him he's happy and it's khair for him absolutely and when you know calamity befalls him he is patient and there is khair in it for him absolutely there's certain things in our deen that are so powerful in terms of personal development and mindset mm. i just don't think that we talk about them enough and that's why i wrote a book about it <laughs> there's no two ways about it there are certain um, based on obviously scripture there's certain transformational concepts and yeah. realities yeah L- like the one you just mentioned that all good and bad comes from Allah accepting the decree and that there is khair in all of this yeah. right when you're tested when the times are good when the times are bad there is goodness and benefit and reward immense reward in 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 all of them um how and, the, do- and the, so can i just say this at this point as well is that the khair is is in akhirah yeah. if we're patient but it's not just in akhirah there is a direct payoff in for this, you in, in this, this life, life. Yeah, yeah, why because Every time you are called upon to kind of push through something difficult, something uncomfortable, what do you discover on the other end of that? Something that you didn't know you could do before. Of course. Something pushes you, whatever yeah. it is, and you you it's difficult, it's scary, you know, you're afraid to fail and all of that, but you do it anyway. Yeah. What do you discover on the end of that? Mm. 
I could do I can do this. I I, I was resilient. I was uh you know um you know strong enough to do that. I was uh you know patient enough to do that. I have now discovered another higher version of myself. And if for me if I can keep doing that until I return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm-hmm. I feel I have truly fulfilled the potential that he created in me um, in, this, in, this, in this life, you know. And I feel that that, that, that that desire to better ourselves and to be the best version of ourselves mm-hmm. is a powerful thing for anyone, male, female, Muslim, non-Muslim. But as Muslims, it's even more special because... Everything you have, the potential, the capabilities, the talents, they're all gifts from Allah. Mm. And they're amana as well. So if it's amana, you're going to be questioned about it. So my thing is like, get to it. You know, stop Absolutely. stop coasting through life. Yeah. Come off autopilot. Start living mindfully, aware of what you're doing, aware of your choices and engaging fully with your life. Because you only get one on this dunya at the end of the day. Is there anything that you've written in this book which you've not addressed in your previous publications? Yeah, it's all new. All new, yeah. It's all new, yeah. Uh, but similar themes? No, from not at all. New. From my sister's lips is a memoir. Yeah. So it's a story of my childhood and you know coming to Islam and then what it was like to live as a relatively new Muslim. And then it had stories of other sisters, etc. And it kind of went through things very kind of methodically in terms of salah and you know the aqidah yeah, 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 and course, you know marriage and children, etc. This is nothing like that. This is a personal development manual. Wicked. Yeah. Um, Sanami, it was absolutely a great honor to have you on. Um, is there a is there a single place where people can buy this book and all your publications? Uh, Amazon. Amazon. I, I hate yeah. to say Amazon, but so it's true. Say, say it's Amazon. <laughs> also, make sure the links there at the bottom uh, so people can pre order. I'm looking very forward to the read. Um, I want to say to you personally, as someone who's observed your work, even mm-hmm. though it's the first time that we've met today, um, I'm a great admirer of your work. And okay. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts it uh, and that it makes it weigh heavy on your mizan Amen. and that Allah raises the ranks of your previous husband and to uh, grant you Jannat al-Fardos. I mean, but the podcast isn't done yet, um, as is the sunnah of my show, is that we give our guests three options. Oh, With sisters, it's only two options because obviously we can't arm wrestle sisters. Um, <coughs> being of Bengali heritage, um, I've got two delicacies I'd like you to oh try. Um, one is it's not pan, is it? it is pan. <laughs> no, but hold on. There's pan and it's, and it's sweet pan. Or, or you can try that's a betel nut or something. That's betel nut and the leaf, but it's sweet. Or you can try Mr. Nugger. Mr. Nugger's a little spicy, but you have to try one. Now it's up to you which one you want to try. Uh, I think I'm gonna go for that. You, okay. Yeah. Before you go for that, let me go run and get you some water. <laughs> oh no! I have water here. I have water here. You got water there. I got my water here. Right, water there, yeah? La ilaha illallah. La She's Nigerian, so that. Makes La sense. Yinka. Do you remember when Linka tried this? She loved it. I gave. I gave her the butt. It smells nice though. It's just. It's nice. Ooh, yeah, but yeah. take, t- take a small portion. Okay, it's very good. Yeah, because yeah. So and, and and give me your honest thoughts. And the water's next to you. Bismillah. This reminds me of the hot wings challenge that they do. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people do them before. Absolutely dying. No, because obviously, uh, it's either an arm wrestle or this or the pan. And obviously, is that okay? Bismillah. I think you should be fine. Is is this a suitable amount? Is that does that allow? Let me, is let me it see, too let small? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. No, t- behave. <laughs> Young Fayani, it's yeah. okay, yeah? Bismillah. Okay, Bismillah. <laughs> it's very Nigerian tasting. Yeah? Very Nigerian tasting, it's okay. You cool? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Would you like to take a tub with you? Is it something that you'd eat with the family? Yeah. I got one It's like you. a mango acha. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. Mm. You sure? Yeah. Wicked. Yeah, I like that. Wicked, wicked, wicked. Mm. Sister Naimo, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, sis. Um, Either uh, on a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would, with it some would, spinach it would, and would, stuff. It would, yeah, it would. It, nice. It's banging with, with so many foods. Mm. But listen, it was great having you on. Thank you. Um, I know you've got a very busy weekend. Um, and this is definitely the first of many times we hope to have you on, inshallah. inshallah. Brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. Uh, please subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Uh, check out Sister Naima's publications on Amazon uh, Follow her on all her socials uh, Subscribe to the channel Like the video, share the video And until next time Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Blood Brothers Podcast Five Pillars Production